Hello, everyone. Welcome to History Matters. And so does coffee. And a really, 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 I had a busy week. So coffee, I can't make it strong enough, basic, basically. But Annie has like the real official mug there with newbie on it. Okay, so today we are going to be talking, I think I titled the History and Democracy, the Dynamic Duo, but it really is about history and why um, it's so important, particularly right now, and why people are making such a fuss about how we teach it and learn it, which in some ways is always an issue, but it's particularly an issue right now. And that's what I want to discuss this morning. But before I discuss anything having to do with that, I turn to my partner in crime, Annie, who is way more awake than me right now, and she will explain the rules of the game. Good morning, everybody. I'm Annie Evans from New American History, and I am awake and so <laughs> delighted to be with you all. Um, it's a very cold morning here in Virginia, but I'm excited about this topic. When Joanne announced it last night, I immediately was thinking like superheroes and how could we turn today's talk into a graphic comic book, you know, story for kids. Like a lasso and yes, magical Like a Wonder Woman. <laughs> yes, yes. I was totally thinking of that. So here, if you're new, please let us know in the chat because we want to say hi to all of our new friends. Um, but if you're new, this is how this works. Joanne's going to talk about today's topic for about 30 minutes. You can engage in the chat, whether you're here on Zoom or over there on Facebook. And we have a Q&A box down towards the bottom of your screen. We would love for you to put topics about, excuse me, questions about today's topics in the q and I'll be back in about 30 minutes and we'll field those questions. So we'll see you in a bit. Uh, and if you are here for the first time, please do tell us. Uh, because you will get a robust welcome from the wonderful History Matters community. We are approaching our 200th straight episode of History Matters. Um, and we will be celebrating uh, with cocktails, more on that to come. Uh, but that's why it's such a wonderful community, man. 200 straight episodes. And many of the people here in this community have pretty much been here all along. So um, at any rate, tell us if you're here for the first time. Uh, also, I was told this morning that um, there is a bingo card and I will allow others to, in chat, uh, allow for where that is and how people can find it. But um, we do indeed very often here, or at least everyone else does. I don't play bingo and I try hard not to think about it because if I think about it while I'm talking, then I will know exactly what to say to give people bingo. <laughs> That's a problem. So at any rate, um, we have been playing bingo for a very long time and you are welcome to join us in that as well. History matters bingo. However, what I do want to talk about today and, and the idea was sparked um, in a sense by my preparation and thinking about the event that I did, the live event that I did with um, my friend Heather Cox Richardson on uh, Wednesday. Uh, and so I was thinking a lot about what she's written and I was thinking a lot about what I've written and what I've thought about and what she's thought about. And um, what stayed with me from that was something that you know, given that we're here through the National Council for History Education, it's something we should talk about here. Uh, and that is why the study of history has such vital political importance. Because that's, if you think about it, all of the attention, not just on books that are allowed to be taught or that are being banned from school libraries, um, the larger issue of what is supposed to be taught in school, what is not supposed to be taught in schools, the sort of very deliberately murky um, rules about what can and cannot be taught, deliberately murky so that people will be nervous about even coming near any of the topics that people are uncomfortable about, many of those topics having to do with race and racism. Heaven forbid we actually allow for the fact that that has and does exist in America. Um, so we certainly are seeing a lot of attempt, and right now from the right, to say that we should only study what makes the United States great and not study any of these unpatriotic other things that some are even denying. Wasn't it Nikki Haley that said in the last week that America's not racist? You're not a racist country. I don't have the quote for that, so I won't assert that, but somebody will put that in chat because the History Matters community is the quickest draw with looking things up and finding citations and putting them in chat. So someone will find that. But at any rate, the larger point here really is that um, history is always important. The study of history is always important. We don't need a reason for that. We don't need an excuse for that. But at the particular, this particular moment, it has political importance. 
And it has political importance for a very specific reason. And I, I do want to read a quote from um, Heather's book, Democracy Awakening, uh, that I read during our event uh, and that helped launch this idea for today's discussion. Um, she writes towards the end of her book, a history that looks back to a mythologized past as the country's perfect time is a key tool of authoritarians. It allows them to characterize anyone who opposes them as an enemy of the country's great destiny. And that in a nutshell is what I wanna talk about because there's a need, if you are trying to seize control and have your people be in and have anyone who opposes you be out, one way to do that is to create this golden, mythologized, beautiful past that only you are promoting because other people are probably allowing for the fact that there are also flaws in American history and that the struggle is the history, the struggle for better and worse. I'll get back to that in a moment. But if you are promoting a glorified golden perfect past and saying only I can take you back to that non-existent beautiful golden past, you are setting a stage, you're creating a scenario so that you can say that anyone who doesn't buy into that is an enemy, right? And there, it's, you, you appear to be justified in that because people who don't buy into that are seemingly saying, oh no, America's flawed. Heaven forbid we acknowledge that America's flawed. So that must mean you're not patriotic. You're an enemy to the country. You're acknowledging flaws. Look at us. We're really patriotic. All we do is praise the nation, right? That's it, It's a way creating this kind of idealized perfect past is a way to get people to sign on with you to accept a narrative that is beautiful, despite the fact that it isn't absolutely true, to support that, in essence, to vote for that, and in doing so, vote away their rights, right? Yeah, we want to go back to that, whatever that is, and whoever is or isn't included in the that. There are so many questions you can ask about that golden past, but if you buy into that myth and say, yeah, that's what I want, I want that beautiful non-existent thing, and I'll vote for it, you are probably voting away many, many things that you will be sorry that you were voting away. So authoritarians using history and a very specific version of history as a way to pull in insiders and cast out people who they want to be able to deem outsiders, that's a very tried and true political strategy. That's why at this particular moment, with so many on the right, seemingly not at this moment being totally buying into small d democracy as the thing we should stick to. That's why there's so much attention being paid now, even more than there always is, about what can and can't be taught, what should and shouldn't be said. When I um, introduced this topic on some form of social media, I don't remember which platform, um, someone beamed back, I believe maybe it was someone in Idaho, some again, look to chat because others will be able to tell me, but someone sent me um, a, a, an Idaho official saying, you know, here we teach like the real American history, the beautiful American history, the patriotic American history, the American history that people can love um, coming, you know, they sort of posted that right alongside my statement that um, if you're doing that, then you're not talking about real history. Um, I want to read, and I think I posted it here. I wrote this a long time ago. Here we go. I, I wrote this a long time ago. It used to be at the top of my um, back in the old days Twitter account. Uh, and it it states this, and it gets at this larger idea that I want to talk about. I'm going to come to Thomas Jefferson momentarily because he has a couple things on this that really have a punch. But um, before I quote him, I'll toss in what I said previously. At another moment when this was a big, people were really focusing on teaching the good history, the, the the positive history, the glorious history, the past that never really existed as a way to promote patriotism. So th this is, I sent this to a media outlet of some kind, some publication, and I don't remember which one, and it probably was published. So our, our people out there who are Googling away might be able to find it, but here's what I wrote. Learning history involves evaluating documents from the past, seriously considering conflicting ideas, drawing conclusions based on reliable evidence, debating ideas with others, and owning the bad as well as the good in a nation's past. It requires an open 
mind. It involves wrestling with the uncomfortable as well as uncovering the admirable. The only way to truly know and love a nation is to embrace it in all its complexity, including its sins as well as its virtues and work for a better future. The study of history, the sincere, open and serious study of history in all its complexity is dangerous and misleading only if you have something to hide. And it's impossible to understand ourselves as a nation and to reckon with the roots and implications of our current moment if we deny the uncomfortable parts of America's past. I wrote that in a similar moment to what I'm feeling right now, which is you can't really love your country without acknowledging it in its fullness, right? Not just the parts that you like or the parts that you're making up, but it for what it is and what it has done and what it hasn't done and the mistakes it's made. There is no way we can get to a better future, better meaning better for as many people as we can possibly make it better for, if you are denying the existence of the simple facts of how we got to where we are now. Now here we, we that's my unplanned segue to Thomas Jefferson. When I thought of this topic this morning, I did of course, not just because my, my uh, affiliation with UVA in the past, he particularly said many times why he thought that the study of history was important, was important academically, but more than that, he considered it important politically. Um, so here in the notes on the state of Virginia, in query number 14, she said very quickly, reading a Roman numeral, um, I said, I've had enough coffee to read Roman numerals. Um, here's what he said in query 14 in notes on the state of Virginia. He said, history, by apprising students of the past, will enable them to judge of the future. It will avail them of the experience of other times and other nations it will qualify them, and this is the part that I was thinking of this morning. It will qualify them as judges of the actions and designs of men. It will enable them to know ambition under every disguise it may assume and knowing it to defeat its views. So Jefferson there is saying, if you study history, first of all, you can judge of the future, prepare for the future, but also you will understand not just in American history, but in all of human history, what ambition looks like, what, um, in a sense, evil looks like, you will recognize it, you will see it for what it is, and you can work against threats to your country when they come. Studying history, understanding the human condition and, and the human experience and what people have and haven't done in the past in your nation and in other nations, it's power right? It's information. It teaches you how people behave. It teaches you how people have behaved in your country. It teaches you what has happened and what patterns have happened and how that might inform you about patterns to come. Information is power. The study of history is power. The understanding, the real understanding, the contextualized, full, complex understanding of history generally and American history specifically, that's real power. That really allows you to understand why we are standing where we're standing, what we've done right and what we've done wrong and what we can do better to move ahead and make the United States a better place for as many people as we can possibly make it a better place for. So the study of history is power and thus, authoritarians who want absolute power are not really excited about the full and open study of history. They don't want that kind of power out among the common folk like us. They want a very particular message to be sent out into the world. They want people to buy into that message. They want people to vote for that very appealing message. And then they will have those people. And you know, as the founding generation said about demagogues, they will say and do what they need to say and do to get power and then do whatever the heck they want to do with that power once they have it. And we, the American people, will have voted that into place. So the study of history is always important. The study of history always provides context, information, insight, understanding. But at a moment like the present moment, when democracy is on the table and authoritarianism is on the table, it becomes particularly vitally politically 
important because you either allow the power of that knowledge out into the world so that people can judge where they are and work towards what they want, or you try to banish knowledge of a certain kind that's going to get in the way of what you want the nation to be. So if you can avoid having people think about racism, talk about racism, acknowledge racism, pretend as though everything is perfect here and it always has been perfect here. And if you vote for one or another candidate, you can keep this perfection. That's an interesting message, but it's not a true one. And acknowledging that the United States is racist doesn't condemn it to the flames of hell. It means we have a problem with racism in the United States and we can work against the problem. We can work to make things better. That's reality. That's that's actual facts. Um, it, it's striking and somewhat remarkable that someone could say no, that they're, we don't have a problem with racism in the United States because simply saying that <laughs> shows we have a real problem with racism, right? So so history right now is political. It's why I titled this episode, History and Democracy, The Dynamic Duo, because you can't have a full and healthy democracy if you're denying the realities of history for better and worse. They have to go together. And if you're trying to work against democracy, you really want a very specific view of history to be in place and you want a lot of inconvenient truths to be out of the way. Now, this means that the teaching of history is particularly important. Um, and I actually found this morning a Jefferson quote um, that I haven't used before uh, that relates to this as well. Um, and he, I know I've spoken before at some point about the fact that he really in um, his old age was working a lot on education and the structure of education in the state of Virginia. So this is in relation to one of those efforts of his. Um, and he was explaining in this particular, I think it's actually, um, a le I, now see, this is bad historian. I didn't write about where it came from. I just wrote down the quote, um, but it's in his old age. And I, I might even be um, an, uh, writing it to an uh, official body in Virginia about why it's important to study history, but someone is going to have to look this up because I have failed and I have clearly not had enough coffee since I didn't write down where I got this from, but it is a real quote. Um, Jefferson said it was important that all children learn history because, quote, apprising them of the past will enable them to judge of the future. And the part of the quote that struck me after that statement is what I wanted to offer here, because he was talking about learning history in school. And he said it's important to learn history in school because, quote, the principal foundations of future order will be laid here in schools. Think about that statement. The principal foundations of future order will be laid here in schools. Now that can be true for better and worse, right? If you're learning a, a very specific, unrealistic view of history, I suppose there's a particular kind of order in the future um, that might be laid with that kind of study and that kind of understanding. But that idea that in a school, the study of history and the way in which it teaches children to think about their world and the past and the present and the future, that that will lay the principal foundations of future order. That's a really powerful idea. That's a really powerful thought. And I think a really true one. And it's one of the ideas that I was thinking about a lot in um, preparing for my event uh, with Heather, because she has said a lot and I have said a lot, and I've certainly said it a lot here, right? Words matter. The words we choose matter. The way we express things matter. The way other people express things, the precise words, you know, is it a riot? Is it an insurrection? Is it a coup? Um, is it a demonstration? You know, the words we choose matter. And in the case of what we're talking about now, democracy and, and history, they matter because the way we think about things, the words we use to describe them, will shape our understanding in a broad sweeping kind of way. And by that, I mean the stories, meaning narratives that we tell as historians or that we read as people interested in history, shape how we understand our world, how we understand ourselves, what we're capable of. Articulating what our history is and articulating what democracy means allows us to understand it. We need to have words and of something. You know, we need to, to have the words for it and to study its existence, to understand it and to own it 
and to work for it. So history matters, the teaching of history matters, how we teach history matters, and the ways in which we encourage people, so, and many of us here, certainly not all of us, but many of us here are teachers, as a teacher, when you are articulating what democracy means, when you're offering the full history of how it has and hasn't worked over the years in the United States and in other places, you are enabling your students to have a sense of what it is, that it exists, what it can mean. You, in a sense, you're not just laying the groundwork and get back to Jefferson here. Um, you're not just laying the principal foundations of future order for the nation, but in a sense, you're doing that for your students as well. So it, it it's vitally important how we teach, and this is not news to anyone watching this, but I'm gonna say it anyway, how we teach and what we teach, because in doing so for our students and in a larger way, for anyone talking about American history or American politics, by articulating what democracy is, by articulating our history of working for and against it, you enable people to understand and conceptualize not just where we've been, but where we can go, what we can achieve. And that's what we should be working for, right? Making as many, making things better for as many people as we can possibly make them better for. Not deciding that only certain people deserve good and the rest of us need to be cast out as enemies because we don't buy into whatever the little magical tale that's being told is. That's what we should be doing. That's what we should be working for. And that's that's knowledge and history as democracy. It's empowering. It gives you the power to understand you and your place in the world and your country and the world in a different way. That's why it's so unfriendly to authoritarians. They don't want us to have that power. And we should be giving people that power to evaluate things for themselves, to think for themselves, to understand the past in all its complexity, to understand their nation in all its complexity. You know, as someone who works uh, obviously a lot on the founding era, and I've talked about this before here too, that's a great example of the um, complexity of trying to study our history in its full complexity, right? Because that particularly, if you're talking about a time when people, some people like to create this golden, beautiful, mythological past when everything was wonderful and the founders were great and boy, you know, America, that's the real America. Well, you can make the founders golden idols, which they weren't, and they would be the first people to tell you that they weren't. I, I said this actually last last night, Wednesday night at the um, event that I did that, you know, John Adams was the first to say in his old age, like, yeah, no, we, we weren't perfect. There's a wonderful letter of his in which he says, uh, because in his old age, people kept writing to Adams saying, tell us, tell us about the writing of the declaration and the golden, beautiful time that you took part in. And he kept saying over and over and over again, yeah, no, we, we really weren't perfect. We made mistakes. And there's this one letter in which he said, we made mistakes in 1777, 78, 79, 80, 81. And he like, you know, the ultimate deadpan, he just marches this way, like one year after another, after another. It's like, we made mistakes all the time because we didn't necessarily know what we were doing. We were trying really hard, but there was no golden period. And he's a guy in the period that people like to call golden and beautiful. I've quoted him before saying that he sat in the Second Continental Congress and watched people sign the Declaration of Independence and could see on their face how unhappy they were with the signing of it. So, you know, if the founders themselves, and John Adams is always a great one for this, step forward and say to you, yeah, we're not perfect. You want us to be folks, and he's saying this in like, you know, 1820, 1814. You want us to be perfect. We're not, we weren't, and we aren't, and it's flawed, and, and that's important because this is a human enterprise. Again, it shows you the falseness of trying to pretend that that moment was perfect. Even the people in that moment are the first to tell you, yeah, no. <laughs> that's, it's cute that you want to make us perfect, but we really, we weren't. Uh, and, and for all the reasons that I'm um, talking about this morning, that can actually be harmful, limiting thinking. Um, the other half of that equation though, talking about the founding is to say that it's not worth studying the founding because the people there were so flawed, uh, so many of them enslaved people. Uh, they came up with these ideas and didn't live up to them. Uh, they didn't even necessarily believe in the ideas. There are many, many reasons to look back to the founding and be angry 
because people at that moment didn't live up to even what they were, you know, if you want to say pretending to believe. I don't think they were pretending to believe these things. I also don't think they lived up to what they were necessarily saying. And I don't think they planned to. They were nervous about democracy in a in a general sense. They weren't very excited about everybody having all kinds of power all the time. They were nervous about it. And we've talked about this before. But what's important is that they did have ideas in trying to create something that wasn't a monarchy. They came up with ideas that ended up being embodied in particularly the Declaration of Independence, but in our founding documents. And even if they weren't living up to them or even intending to live up to them, they came up with those ideas and put them out into circulation. And that mattered enormously because later people, marginalized peoples of all kinds, could hearken back to those ideas and those words in founding documents and say, you know what? You said that these are rights. You said that that's what this country stands for. Well, guess what? I'm in this country. I'm part of this country and I want those rights. That's power. So those ideas, again, those actual ideas, they may not have been lived up to at that moment, but that doesn't mean we cast out the founding moment as not worthy of study. It means the ideas that came out of that moment certainly matter a lot and mattered enormously for people to come over time. It also matters that the people in that moment, whether or not they wanted to live up to those ideas or not, they were trying for something better. They may not have gotten there. They may not have even, for many of them, intended to get there. They certainly were highly flawed um, and slavery tinged everything that they did in that time period. But I think you can acknowledge the the evil of slavery in that time period while still acknowledging that there were people in that moment mired in that that dirt thinking about something that either got out above it or pushing it aside to see beyond it either way not great but it mattered what they did mattered and it mattered for future people so whatever we want to say about the founding and we can debate that all we want we can debate that i'm going to be done in a moment or two we can debate that uh now we can talk about how we think about the founding but what they did matters, whether or not they lived up to it or not, that's a different question. That's a history question. Um, but another history question is the documents they wrote, the ideas that they had, um, all kinds of people gained rights in later years because that ended up being put out into the world in print. And that matters too. So all of that, the, the struggle against what happened the struggle towards these ideas that were put out into the world, but initially not lived up to. You know, I said, and I even think I have a quote floating around here somewhere. Um, the struggle is our history. And I don't mean that to be, you know, our history is all ugliness. The struggle is our history. The struggle that sometimes ends up in things that are worse and sometimes ended up in things that were better. The struggle of movement, right? The, the process of becoming and unbecoming whatever we are as a nation, that's history. And it's the same as with democracy. I've said before many times, democracy is not an end point, it's a process. And you can think of our history that way too. History unfolds, it's still unfolding. We are, <laughs> I don't wanna say we are becoming history, that's rather gloomy. Yes, we're becoming history. <laughs> All of us at one point or another will become history. But what I really mean is um, history is always unfolding and the struggle to figure out who we are and what we are and what we can be and, and how we can get there, that's our history. Doesn't mean that our history is all evil and bad. It means the struggle is our history. It's humanity. That's what people do. They work and they struggle and they strive and they succeed and they fail. And that's humanity, right? The humanities teach that. That's not good to study the humanities. At any rate, my larger point here is um, at this particular moment, it's worth any time you see someone saying we must only study the glorious past, it's vitally important to think about the political motive behind that. Why tell people not to study our history in all its complexity? Why not acknowledge flaws? Why not? Well, if you're trying to hide something and you're trying to get people to think only in a certain kind of a way, that's why. Um, you know, for if you want people to have an open mind and really work towards a, a, a better future for many, many more people, allow them to think for themselves, to evaluate evidence themselves, to think independently, to really understand our history, not just the pretty parts.
okay, three minutes over and Annie's face has appeared. So now I know I'm really supposed to stop. Um, but Mug, are really, the chat is probably the most lit up it's been in the new year. Okay. I hope that's good. You have stuck a nerve. <laughs> okay. Good. I, that's, that's good. Um, but I will show the mug. Um, I, I use, I, I put my notes above the chat notes so that I can't, um, see them. Otherwise I'm going to be totally talking with everyone the whole time. And then I lower them. And what I always see is mug, 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 mug. <laughs> okay. Um, this is a Carolee mug. And so Carolee, this is again, you'd have to feel better soon. Yay. It's history mugs. Yay. History, history matters. It's a celebration of history and a celebration of this community. So, um, it explains the origin of yay history on the back, but yeah. this is the month for today. Uh, on the back, it says, I don't know who the mysterious masked person was who passed me on the street while I was eating ice cream and yelled, yay history. But whoever you are, you made my night. <laughs> <laughs> that was, when was that? 2020. Okay. Wow. I know. Years ago. 200 episodes ago. 200 episodes ago. Okay. But not quite. 199. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Okay, I'm going to open everything oh. up so I can see what folks are saying. All right, folks, don't forget, you can put your questions in the Q&A. Um, all right. And yes, you can buy those mugs on the NCHE store. Shameless <laughs> <laughs> plug there for John. <laughs> Sorry, John. <laughs> oh, I love the beginning of Dave's first question. It says, if you could wave a magic wand... <laughs> That's a good start for questions. That's a great starter question. See, Dave, you didn't even have to use Springsteen in the question. It still got me. He says, if you could wave a magic wand, would you prefer Americans agreed on current facts or they agreed on American history? He has that part mm -hmm. in quotes. Wow. Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I would say is for the moment, Agreeing on current facts would be good because it might help us get out of this moment and then we could agree on history and find our way into the future. But I think we're kind of, if we can't agree on current facts, we're in a bad situation uh, and we won't, it'll be very hard for us to find our way um, out of this moment. So I, I think, I think that's my, my, my multi-stage answer to that question. I think. I like it. That's a great opening question. Yeah. Thank you. That's an excellent opening question. Mm -hmm. Okay, our good friend Debbie asks, you said the word we the words we say matters in shaping how people think. However, sometimes people can feel alienated because they are not using politically correct words. To cite a relatively non-emotional example, homeless person versus person experiencing homelessness. How can we navigate trade-offs in this area? Well, I think the underlying question there, which is thinking about the impact of the words you use and how they affect people is important. And I, you know, I mean, so for example, I think uh, for a very long time, uh, when I spoke, I, I would use the word slave, a slave did this or a slave did that, or here, here's what this slave did. And I now say enslaved person, because I now feel and didn't see at the time Slave is like an object. Enslaved person makes it clear what's going on. It's a person who is enslaved. And that is the important way to understand it, right? So I have changed the way I refer to that now. Um, so, you know, I think I think sometimes people, um, and, and some people who I'm, I'm close to even um, get angry at, you know, what they see as political correctness, that no matter what you say, it's somehow wrong and... You know, if you if you say, I don't know, whatever, and I'm not even talking about obviously insulting, nasty, racist words, but just like what I just said, you know, slave versus enslaved person or whatever, some other examples, even, you know, a homeless person or, or person experiencing homelessness or um, illegal alien or, you know, whatever words people choose to use. And some people um, get angry, right, that they're going to be chided for the word choice that they use. I think our words matter. I think people aren't necessarily used to that. I don't necessarily think it's, I think we can get used to that idea without jumping on each other's faces all the time. Uh, and that's what gets people mad, I think, is the response to that idea, not the idea itself. But I think it matters. I think the words we choose matter. And I think if we choose a word poorly and someone says, you know, that hurts, that's a learning moment. 
then we don't do that again, right? And I don't think that's policing language, and I don't think that's even necessarily political correctness. It's just thinking about how you say things and the impact of the things you say, right? I mean, the same thing, I, I, you know, people get so irate about pronouns, right? Ah, you know, and then they say ridiculous things like, you know, I don't believe in pronouns. It's like, yeah, try speaking a sentence. Good luck on that. But yeah. above and beyond that, so what? Someone has to be called something, call them what they want to be called. What's the big deal? Honestly, like, anyway, I'll stop. Um, that's that's veering us off into a different topic. Bigger fish to fry. <laughs> Bigger fish. But but my my general idea uh, here is um, it matters what we say. And if someone says that bothers me, okay, then think about it. Rather than saying I don't care if it bothers you, <laughs> you're bothering me. Well, <laughs> think about that. So I'll 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 pause there. I do find there's a lot. There's, you just lit up the chat again with just this last question. But I do find kids kind of get it. Kids yeah. are not bothered by, yeah, the textbook calls calls it this one thing, but I know my friend prefers to be called something else, or I know that it, you know, words I matter. want to be called something else. Right. So, okay. right. so the, kids get it. I'm, I'm yeah. encouraged by or inspired that kids are maybe going to get it right. <laughs> yes, I know. I know. Well, I know. We, we're, we live in a time when it's such, there's such a sense, and I, we've talked, I've talked, I haven't recently done it as much, but I've talked about we, that, you know, our sense of we is a little damaged right now, and that the pandemic showed that off, right, that we couldn't even think of we enough to put a piece of cloth over our mouth. Some of us, like, no, my rights to not have cloth on my mouth are being violated. It's like, oh, hush. But at any rate, you know, we're not we're not really good at, at, at we. And this falls into that, too, that people are like, I don't want to call you what you like. Who cares what you want? Right. Like like I, I this is unrelated, but it made me gave me the same feeling. Um, someone said something somewhere out in the world of online that um, pets are like family members. And then some people were like, you know, no, like that's wrong. Like you warped people who think pets are family members and that your parents. And my response was. Who cares what you think? People have pets. They feel how they want about their pets. Find something else to talk about, right? It's like, why do you think it matters? Yeah. What, you what, what encourages me when you brought up the pronoun thing. So we had a school board in a particular part of Virginia flip this past election. And as soon as they got in in January, boy, they lit into the pronouns. And now the teachers have to fill out a form if a kid has to be called another name and a bunch of nonsense. And it's creating, again, more paperwork for teachers that's taking them away from planning good lessons. And so the kids are so smart. So a bunch of kids got together and said, OK, you want to single out my one or two trans friends? And they went into every class and told every teacher on their schedule. So they have like seven or eight teachers a day. They gave every single teacher a different nickname. So now all these kids are giving seven or eight different nicknames to seven or eight different teachers. So now the people who have to go through the forms that want to like single out these one or two kids are going to have to go through thousands of forms before they get to the kid that they're trying to like suppress or- I am Spartacus. Right? I and so the kids are like, <laughs> you, want, you want nicknames? We'll give you nicknames. So the kids are not having it, right? They are, they are going to outsmart you. It's the same thing with the teacher tip line here in Virginia. The kids use it to call and report good teachers, not teachers that are woke or whatever. So I just love how kids will find a way to get around the bad guy. <laughs> it Yes, just yes. I mean, in part, what we're talking about is we and in part, what we're talking about is respect yep. for other people um, and not, you know, getting your, what is the saying, nose out of joint because someone says, I'd rather be called this. Yeah. Yeah. The kids, you know, they give me hope. Okay, so Daniel has a, a question. All right, this is a little bit long, so let's, let me focus here. Okay. okay, folks on the far right want to point to a glorious past. Folks on the far left characterized almost everyone in power as a colonizer and occupier. One would have us only talk about the good one would leave us feeling endless guilt. I know how to trash the far right, less good at giving context to the far left. Can you help? Right. Well, which is a good question. And I, I touched on it, at least in some of my comments. Right. Um, it's important. Look, yesterday, I talked about um, 
settler colonialism in my American Revolution course, right? And the idea that of, of you know exterminating or eliminating the people on a certain land so that you can get the land and dealing with people who are there as inferior so that you don't have guilt about eliminating or exterminating those people and then you can take their land right and that's just a fact and people have done that and people are doing that and like that that exists right as a as a practice so on the one hand yes that exists but i don't think for the same reason that i don't think you can dismiss you can have a golden umbrella and put all of history under it and say it's all beautiful i don't think it's accurate necessarily to say that it's all ugly you have to acknowledge, I mean, that's a fact that has and continues to happen, right? We It happens and happened and it's a fact and we have to see it and understand it and reckon with it and acknowledge that it's happening rather than not seeing it. But allowing for the fact that that's happening doesn't mean that we block out all of the complexity and the complications and the fact that not everybody, even in a country that's enforcing that, agrees on what's happening. I talked yesterday in my revolution course <clears throat> about um, years ago when I taught this course, I would largely was teaching, although I did uh, try to explain why the British did what they did militarily as far as their strategy goes as to why they thought it was smart and it wasn't smart, their military strategy. Um, but I didn't necessarily talk about the complexity in England that not everyone agreed on what should be happening in the colonies, right? And I just didn't go into that. And I, there was one year where I had a, a British student who sat in the front row and had this expression on his face at various points during the semester. And of course, I would then go up to him and I would be like, like what, you know, he's like, everyone didn't agree in parliament, like everyone didn't. And I was like, no, you're absolutely right. And I didn't say that, you know? And so that student got me to actually say, okay, so the British, you know, Many of them felt X, Y, and Z, and many of them were arrogant about the colonists, but not all of them were, and that matters, right? Because that interplay affected how things played out. So um, I think acknowledging the complexity in history goes many directions, um, and it doesn't mean not allowing for and, and owning and reckoning with the ugliness. That's vital. We can't get past it if we pretend like it wasn't or isn't there. But it's not the only thing that's there. And so I, as a historian, I just argue for historical complexity and, our, and and attempting to get our arms around it for better and worse, but certainly not denying the ugliness of that very ugly, as an example, fact. That's a good one. Thanks, Daniel. All right, Susan asks, uh, do you, why do you think we might, what do you think we might find the New York Public Library out of print documents that you had mentioned? She says, it seems like there's potentially a survivor bias in historical information analysis. Well, that's very true. And and there are, you guys, man, like- Great I, I, questions, right? Great questions. There, well, there's a survivor bias, but there's there's a, there's a white male bias, right? Because the people who thought over the long view whose papers were considered important enough to save, who considered their own papers important enough to save, were, you know, elite white men for the most part for a very long time. So certainly it's true. And and there's much more um, awareness of this and really um, discussion of it in a, in a pedagogical kind of a way of the fact that archives define history in ways that aren't necessarily good by what's in them and what's not in them. So if you go to an archive looking for something, you will find some things and you will, you know, other things will absolutely not be there. And you might not be aware that they're not there because they're invisible. So the simple fact that archives represent the people who collected things, right? They are reflections of what people at a certain time, past and present, considered to be important. That's an important awareness that it's easy to forget if you just think of an archive as a place that gathers things. The gatherers put them there. So what were they gathering, right? What did they include? And this has been true for, you know, in this case, I, I was going to say all kinds of marginalized groups. Well, you know, in, in the way I'm using it, you could say everyone's marginalized except for a certain group of elite white men, because those are the papers that we tend to keep. But um, you need to be aware. And as historians, right, we think about this all the time. Like, you know, so I want to understand a moment and I will have very loud voices screaming in my ears of a certain kind of person from that time period. What about other people, other voices? I'm going to have to deliberately see where I can find some of them. I'm going to have to think about where they might register if their voices aren't 
available? Are there records that will put people there? You know, will census records it, make them exist for me? Are there legal cases I can use? Are there other kinds of records that can give voice to people who it will be harder to find in archives? And that's a huge, that's a question about a um, small d democratic history in a different sense, right? That, that history needs to be democratic, meaning containing multitudes. Uh, and it can't just have elite people. And it's easy to forget. I mean, I'll even tell a story on myself when I started my first, my dissertation, even before it was a book. And the first chapter was on uh, Thomas Jefferson and political gossip. And I read his notes and I saw his political gossip and I began to draw conclusions. And at a certain point I paused and I said, you know, there are absolutely no women talking ever in his notes about politics in the kinds of notes that I was reading. I didn't think about that until I paused, right? I was like, who am I seeing, who am I not? seeing. And then I realized Jefferson really thought that women in politics just basically should not go together in any way. So of course, if you're reading, if you're looking through his eyes and looking at his notes, they're really not going to be present. <laughs> but it, you know, it took me a moment to pause and say, hey, wait, wait, wait a minute. I know what I'm seeing, but what am I not seeing? Um, that's really important to think about and consider, um, you know, related to what I was saying in my comments today, right? That the way you conceptualize things and the words that you use and the words that you see shape your broader understanding. Um, I could very easily have just read Jefferson and drawn the conclusion that, you know, women had absolutely nothing to do with politics at all. Well, in the eyes of Thomas Jefferson, he didn't want them to. Um, so context, historical context um, is pretty huge. And that includes people who um, have not necessarily placed themselves at the center of archives. Yeah. I'm archives so in the chat here. You guys are like, whew. all right. Um, Clinton is asking, Clinton, our bingo card maker and our good buddy, asks, Am I correct in assuming that when Jefferson said school in the quote, he wasn't talking about public school the way we think of K 12 today? Well, so this is part of what he was talking about. And it's worth looking at what, what he wanted. He wanted, um, actually, and for a time, not just um, uh, boys, but girls too. He thought that um, there should be a certain, a couple of years of education that white boys and girls got for the reasons that I said, that quote about laying the foundation for the future. Um, that that document, he was saying that there should be, and and I think it was like, it was the younger grades that he was saying that about, right? That's where you're laying foundations. Um, he did want a, a version of a kind of idea about public school for younger kids because he thought it was actually, among other things, culturally, socially, and politically important for students to study and understand a certain number of things, including history. So in that sense, it, he wasn't just talking about private schools. He did think that beyond three years or so, I believe it's three years was the, the number, then you should get choosy about who you're educating and the phrase he uses. So, you know, Jefferson, talk about um, the complexity of the past. He's treated so often as Mr. Democracy, but what he says in one particular document about who gets educated and who doesn't is he, and again, I'm not, I'm going to be offering you a bad paraphrase. He says, um, you know, people should all have a certain three years. And then after that point, you should, we should rake the rubbish to find the people who deserve to go ahead. Okay, so Mr. Democracy, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and that that right there, he's like, you know, let's give education to a lot of people, and then the you know the the, the and rubbish. No we, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. So so he was kind of thinking along public lines. There was a lot of thought. Um, if, if you have an interest, there's a lot you can read about it, but there's a lot of thought about education in the early republic because the assumption was, um, unlike a monarchy in a republic, a democratic republic, um, the people are, are responsible for giving power, which means you need an educated and responsible citizenry, which means people need education. So in a way that um, Americans at the time thought was not necessarily true of monarchical nations, Americans needed to be educated. So suddenly you have attention being paid to uh, schooling of, of girls. Suddenly you have discussion of, of different kinds of schools opening. You, you have a lot of discussion of education and it was for political reasons because the citizenry needed to be educated and understand the importance of what they were doing because their choices as citizens 
was going to profoundly shape the nation and they could bring it down as well as build it up. Um, that's a that's a powerful idea and that goes all the way back to the, the founding of the nation. All right, we have one more question. We're doing great on time, kids. Ooh, okay. So Dave says, words matter. When did the word woke take over the phrase critical race theory? And can you, I'm not sure what word he typed there. I think it was a typo. Can you deign either or both fit into a bumper sticker? <laughs> oh, can you decide if either one or both oh. fit on a bumper sticker? So he's asking okay. about how that term woke came about um, and, you know, kind of taking the turn away from the critical race theory stuff the last couple of years. Well, well, you know, woke now means um, whatever bad thing people on the right want it to mean. It's now become a word that, you know, it, you know, it, again, in my the first lecture of the semester, I, I told my students that they're not allowed to use democracy speak. Uh, and by that, I mean, liberty, freedom, you know, the tossing words around democracy and, and not thinking about what the words mean. The words sound American. They all seem good. We'll just put them in our essays and put them on our essay questions and our tests and it'll all be great. Uh, and there's no meaning. And I said, no, actually. Um, they had meanings. And I talked about how democracy was not necessarily seen as a good thing by many in the founding generation, but also how they understood democracy. And woke is the same category now. Woke just doesn't mean anything because it means everything. And and so at this point, someone who says, you know, woke, woke, woke mind virus, they're they're just, it's just a way to say bad, bad. You know, initially it was supposed to mean, are you awoke, aware? alert to the fact of the inequality and the racism. Are you aware of it? Are you awake? Are you are you noticing what's going on? It wasn't some, you know, great evil plot. It was a simple fact. Are you awoke, woken? Are you awake? Are you aware of what's around you? That's what it was. It's been taken on with this, you know, to mean somehow like woke mind virus. I mean, if woke really does mean aware of the fact that there's inequality or, and that there needs to be more diversity and more equality. Yeah. Okay. Then I'm woke too. That, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it's now a useful word that has no meaning. Yeah. And crap. Point out, DEI is now sort of the new yes. CRT or, or woke. Critical race theory now is not as useful as DEI. DEI has now become, um, you know, bad. It has no meaning. It's just bad you know, diversity, equity, inclusion. Oh no, you know, I mean, think about people who are saying we hate DEI. What are they actually saying? Because they're, they're no one, well, not no one. It's very easy not to think about what exactly you're saying if you don't like DEI. You're being pretty blatant, right? I hate diversity initiatives. Now I understand people are, they're saying like, no, no fair. Like you shouldn't be giving people preference. Well, I'm not gonna delve into that at this particular moment in the last four minutes of this discussion. However, if you are screaming about woke and if you are screaming that you hate DEI, you you probably are not thinking about what you're screaming. You're screaming useful buzzwords and catchphrases. Um, and now DEI has replaced critical race theory and critical race theory was being used in the most nonsensical matter, manner possible, right? It was something very specific with a very important and powerful meaning, but it was not being taught in math classes in second grade. And, you know, the, the, the sort of nonsense that people came to believe and were willing to believe, you know, I don't know if I told this story here, but Heather and I, in the early days of our podcast, did an episode on critical race theory and what it really was. Uh, and how it was defined and, you know, just, just to say, look, you want to talk about it, fine. This is what it actually is. And at that, this was in the olden days of Twitter uh, when it was still angry, but not like now. And um, someone said, sent me a, a tweet and it said something like, um, you know, um, I really like you as a historian and I don't understand how you can be someone who doesn't hate critical race theory or something along those lines. It's like, I always thought you were a good historian, but but you don't hate critical race theory. What's wrong with you? And I said, well, you know, I suspect you don't really have a, have a full understanding of what critical race theory is. And I tell you what, Heather Cox Richardson and I just did a podcast episode on it. And if you want, you might listen because we just really try to understand what it is and, and 
where it came from and and define it. That's just the simple facts of it. If you want to go listen, and I thought, yeah, you know, right, Freeman, uh, and whatever. You know, I I always I used to try really aggressively when people disagreed with me to be like, like let's talk. Like I, you can read this and you can see this anyway. This guy went away and listened to the podcast episode and came back, and he said, "You're right. Critical race theory is not a bad thing." And I'm like, and then he said. So what did evil people on the left do to make it such a bad thing? I was like, oh, wow. <laughs> it was so close. It was so close. You know, it, it was like, oh, I see. And you're not bad for, you know. Yeah, thank you for that. I see the little laughing thing going up. It was just like, oh, you know, I felt such hope that he went and he listened and he came back and he was like, I learned something. And I was like, look at that, everybody. It's like, oh, okay. No, not so much. Anyway. Wow, guys, this was... This exceeded my superhero um, expectations. <laughs> Did it? This is really good. Yeah. Yeah. With the just, chat is crazy on fire the, today. The, the chat I could see, I couldn't even keep up with it. Um, and the questions were wonderful. Um, and I wasn't even awake. And now I'm 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 way more awake than I was. Yay. Yay. Okay. So um, don't forget you're gonna show us your teapot. Oh yeah. And I won't I won't wait until the um I won't oh, wait. Oh, okay, the after party. Okay. Party. I'll do it now. Okay, yeah, because some people have to have to leave, but it just looks so special. Oh, it's ridiculous. Okay, so um, this my mother really does collect things with chickens. So um, let's see here. That is adorable. <laughs> and it has this little noise. Chick on top? No, it doesn't. But it but it is it is a teapot. Yeah, it reminds me of. Do you, do you remember the Fisher Price barn? And when you opened it, it oh, made yeah. a <laughs> It almost looks like that, like if you could open it. Anyway, so my mother had all of these chickens everywhere. I have, I have, um, there's another chicken here. Yes, there's a chicken hanging out next to Hamilton over there. There's another one of my mother's chickens. I have another chicken in my New Haven house. Anyway, um, she had teapots and then she had the chicken teapot. So I had to, I had to, I had to rescue the chicken teapot. Did you actually get to have tea parties and drink tea out of that? Or was it I one have of those never tried I have never done this. <laughs> Um, okay, but so now let me explain what what is happening next. What is where are we going next? You're now going to go to the after party, um, and what that means is that if you beamed in through NCHE, stay right where you are. A chicken in every pot, Lawrence. Um, stay stay right where you are, and poof, you will be in the after party. What that means is that we will no longer be recording, so that we could be even freer and easier than we normally are because we're so stiff and formal normally. Um, and if you are watching us on Facebook, you need to leave Facebook and go to nche.teach.org slash conversations. That's nche.teach.org slash conversations. And then you too, poof, history matters and so do chickens. You come after my heart with that one. But at any rate, if you go to nche.teach.org slash conversations, um, you too will be in the after party, poof. Um, I do want to repeat what I said, which is we are coming up on our 200th straight episode. We're going to have that week a normal History Matters episode, and then we're going to have History Matters and so do cocktails. We will talk today in the after party about what cocktail we might, if we want to make official cocktails uh, or not. It doesn't matter to me one way or another, but I will certainly be drinking a cocktail and perhaps we can we can influence uh, what cocktails we're drinking, uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic, of course. Uh, but at any rate, um, we are coming up on the 200th straight episode. So I encourage you, particularly uh, if you're new today and you're thinking, what are these crazy people? Uh, stay with us and then come to the cocktail hour because that will be special. 200 episodes, folks. Mind blowing. And 200 episodes of us being here and meeting every week and talking about democracy, having the conversation of democracy, asking questions, debating answers asking difficult questions and you asked a lot of good questions um thank you as ever for being here at a time when we all need to be here here and many other places talking about what's going on uh explaining and understanding what's going on and then taking action uh to benefit in whatever way we can democracy uh and thereby the nation and all of us um thank you uh to annie and thank you john for being here this week uh, it's nice to see you again. Um, oh, and and we might as well say here, right, did we decide what day and time? So we decided Saturday the, what's the date? 
Uh, next Saturday, somebody quick, help me. Someone come up with next Saturday. 27, Saturday the 27th. Saturday the 27th at seven o'clock Eastern time. Seven Eastern time. We hope to advertise it. Coast. Yep. And we hope it's not too late for our friends in England. We know Francesca. I know Francesca. Others. We thought seven o'clock might be possible. Oh, yep. We yep. were thinking of you. Um, so at any rate, um, conflict. No. Uh, so yeah, the, the 27th at seven. We we There were three possible dates. Um, we'll do a little celebrating in the regular episode in the, in the, the 200th episode itself too. So that if you can't make it to the cocktails, there'll be some celebration as well. Um, yes, Francesca, uh, come in your PJs. I already, I already did one of these episodes, uh, in my PJs and you don't even know. <laughs> no, but that one you filmed, you had the cute little like stars or whatever. Yeah, that was, those are my, maybe those we are... should do tiaras and fascinators and PJs. <laughs> Those were, that was an extra, extra large t-shirt from Mount Vernon. Yep. I should stop now because we're still recording. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, John, I to turn that off four minutes ago. Okay, I know, darn. Okay, let us now go to the after party uh, and I will see all of you guys um, next week. <laughs>